Welcome everybody to the second show in a Transhumanist Tea Time run by the Transhumanist Party UK. Uh, welcome all of you to join a conversation today from uh, transhumanists around the world. So let's introduce uh, the people who are joining us today from far off uh, lands. Uh, we have a couple from uh, California who are members of a group called the Transhumanists for Andrew Yang 2020. So Hank and Keith, why don't you introduce yourselves and say, What's led you to this enthusiasm for one particular candidate for the presidency in America? Okay, I'll go first and then I'll introduce Keith. Um, my name is Hank Pellisier. I've been a transhumanist for about 10 years. I was a writer for Humanity Plus. Then I was managing director for IEET, Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technology. Then I was a producer of uh, 10 transhumanist conferences. And then I started the Transhuman Party, and Keith was uh, a wonderful, uh, very active member in it. And he suggested that the Transhuman Party endorse Andrew Yang for president. And I didn't know who Andrew Yang was, but uh, I looked into his platform and I thought it was great. And we started a Transhumanist for Andrew Yang 2020 Facebook page. And uh, I'm really just following uh, Keith's lead in this. He uh, is really motivated me to get involved. So here's here's Keith. Oh yeah, this is me. Hey guys, uh, um, I'm Keith. Uh, I work as a research scientist at a pharma company, and I've been a transhumanist for maybe like two or three years, I would say. So pretty pretty recent. Um, got into it based on Eliezer Yudevsky's Harry Potter and the Methods of Rationalism, where there's one line where it's like a fanfic for Harry Potter. And one line Harry says to Dumbledore, um, if you don't want, or if you want to die one day, then, or say, if you don't want to live forever, then that means you want to die one day. And that really stuck out to me. So that's kind of why, part of why I'm here, <laughs> actually. So you like uh, Eliezer's uh, book? Okay. I remember reading the first 13 chapters and thinking, wow, and then discovering there were, I don't know, goodness knows how many other hundreds of chapters. <laughs> a lot. Yeah, it's oh, fascinating. Yeah, I'm not sure how I came upon Andrew Yang, but uh, when I saw it, I kind of just noticed how a lot of his policy positions are very futurist focused and like future proofing humanity. And I thought that was beautiful for our cause. And that's kind of why I brought it up to Hank. So what is it uh, in more detail that the two of you would like to draw attention to about what uh, Andrew Yang is advocating? Well, I could, I could, uh, Andrew Yang does have a uh, 80, 80 points in his platform. And I can read you some of the points on his platform that are, uh, seem to be very transhumanist. Uh, here's one, he wants to revive the Office of Technology Assessment. Another one that I'm going to talk about more later is combating climate change with emerging technology. Um, he's into gun safety using technology, and Keith is going to talk about that later. Uh, he believes in transparency with law enforcement. He believes every cop should have a camera, and we might talk about that later. Uh, he believes in funding medical technology innovation. He wants to modernize uh, military spending by one thing he wants to do with that is appoint a new secretary of cybersecurity. He wants to ease the transition to self-driving vehicles. Uh, he supports nuclear energy and he wants to regulate AI and other emerging technologies. And we can talk about a lot of these in, in more detail. Uh, and I haven't even talked about UBI. Uh, Keith is gonna be talking about UBI, which is, a, a big, which is the biggest part of this platform. Yes, Keith. So uh, I, I remember coming across Andrew Young myself when I was recommended to read his book, The War on Normal People, which despite the rather strange title is a fascinating book, talks about how normal people, that is people outside of the East Coast and West Coast bubbles, are going to have a very hard uh, life ahead of them, assuming there's no significant change in the trends that we see. And so the war on normal people is something that's happening by default. And Andrew was advocating a range of policies, including UBI, 
So UBI is a topic that's often discussed in transhumanist circles. Well, what's your take on it, Keith? So, so we explain what UBI is for the people who might be. Oh, <laughs> yes, yeah, so UBI is universal basic income. Um, Andrew Yang's version is he's planning to give $1,000 to every US citizen from 18 to 60, I believe, is the age range. Um, regardless of income level, whatever other factors. Um, and his reasoning is that with the onset of automation and uh, like technology, a lot of jobs are going to get lost to that, right? And we kind of need to reinvest in humans and help them kind of live. So. And the U means universal or unconditional? Universal. Uh, universal. universal. But he, he calls it the freedom dividend. Yes. Uh, that, uh, that's his rebranding of, of UBI as the freedom dividend, which I think is a great title. It, uh, the the $12,000 a year uh, does provide freedom. And that's an idea that, or a phrasing that may have more cross party support. Exactly. So, uh, Matthew, yeah. I haven't given you a chance to introduce yourself. Maybe you can uh, introduce yourself for those who haven't seen you before and uh, what's your interest in this subject. Uh, yes, so I'm a co leader of the Transhumanist UK Party, even though I'm French. <laughs> but I've been living in London for about 13 years. And uh, uh, as a profession, I'm a software developer, but I've been a designer, a head of product, and a CEO, and so on. And. Um, yeah, that's, that's basically it. Uh, on the subject, yeah, I just wanted to, to add a little thing, which is in Norway, they run an experiment on universal basic income. And uh, they were still waiting to unfold the, the results. But the first one that came in is that it's um, tremendous for uh, people's well-being. Because uh, finally, instead of people being, uh, um, let's say, um, in constant fear of losing their job, uh, then it sort of eased the insecurity. And then people are not willing to take uh, shit jobs as they used to before. So at least uh, in economical sense, I, I believe that it will make sense as well. But uh, in terms of uh, mental health, mental well-being, UBI is, is tremendous opportunity. It's fantastic. And so it's really, really like freedom, like you say, it's a liberation. It's a, um, it's it's finally we sort of get out of the the, the oppression of you know uh, not keeping a job and so on. I think it will completely reframe how we think of uh, of work in itself. So people will not just do a job because they have to, but perhaps they will take on uh, new projects because they want to. And I think uh, it's a much better incentive to, to get things done. And it might, that's why my assumption is that it might even make us more productive because finally we, we will take on uh, um, projects that people really care about. Is that in line, uh, Hank and uh, Keith, with what you have read of Andrew's uh, pr proposals? Yeah, yeah, I just want I just wanted to mention that. Um, well, let's see. Our Facebook page has four hundred and sixty six members. A lot of those members are not U.S. citizens. They're people outside of the U.S. who are very excited about Andrew Yang running because it's uh, it's it's providing publicity for the idea of UBI, and they want UBI in their country. Uh, two examples of that are uh, Anatoly Anatoly Karlin, who's the transhumanist who lives in Russia, and he wrote a great article on uh, Yang's candidacy and, and, he, and, he, and he's hoping that, uh, uh, you know, that this will give UBI attention and that other, other uh, European countries will adopt it. And um, there's another transhumanist writer, Nicole Salek Anderson, and she writes a lot about UBI. And I think she's actually working for Andrew Yang's campaign. I, I introduced them early on and, and she was very excited to be working with him. So an important part about UBI is that what to what Matthew said um, is that it allows people to pursue what they care about more 
than anything else, right? And that kind of links to Andrew Yang's policy on human capitalism, um, which he defines as making capitalism work for the people as opposed to people working for capitalism. Um, and UBI is part of that, but um, he also has things such as adding metrics to our current economy metrics. So adding things like from, it's just GDP and stock market right now, right? Um, and he wants to add metrics like median income, life, expect life expectancy, rates of substance abuse, social economic mobility, stuff like that. And it's a more holistic view of what our economy actually looks like. I think that's important. Um, but of course, wants, politicians yeah, have yeah. been saying something along these lines for a long time, and I'm old enough to remember Robert Kennedy in mm -hmm. his campaign for the 1968 candidacy before he has unfortunately gone down in a very untimely manner. He had a famous speech lamenting about GDP. It, mm -hmm. uh, it measures everything that doesn't matter, and everything that does matter gets excluded. Oh, right. He said it's, it at this point, it's like 100 years old. <laughs> yes. So, I mean, I'm, I think all politicians in principle will say they're in favor of keeping track of health and keeping track of a uh, well-being. But in practice, it seems that uh, when they get into power, it's uh, business as usual. It's capitalism continuing. Right. I think with Andrew Yang, it's one of his top three policies. <laughs> like, it's his main platform. So I think if he were to be elected, he would definitely uh want to include that <laughs> so here's the difference between uh, something that somebody will agree with if you ask them and what actually people keep on talking about the whole time because many politicians will agree to things if you ask them do you believe in free speech do you believe in democracy they will say yes i do yes i do but then you have to judge them by what they actually spend most of their time talking about so you're saying that Andrew's focus on human capitalism and focus on a freedom dividend is high up on his agenda and what he talks about. They're some of the top things. Does uh, he talk about transhumanism? When I'm just feeding in a question from the live chat from Jean-Michel Carter, has Andrew Yang ever made any explicit mention uh, about the transhumanist movement? Uh, does he identify with uh, our features? <laughs> Well, Keith and I went to one of his initial uh, gatherings. It was at, uh, at a place called Taco Licious in the Mission District of San Francisco. And we went up to him and, and uh, we had him sign our books, uh, the books that he wrote. And we asked him, we told him that we were from uh, the Facebook page, Transhumanist for Andrew Yang 2020. And he asked us what transhumanism meant. And we told him and he, and he said, that sounds, that sounds great. I'm really glad you guys are supporting me. But he, he, had, he did not know what transhumanism was at that time. Now, since then, uh, it got a lot of attention, I think, in the transhumanist world because he started talking to, uh, oh, I'm blanking. Who's the Oxford professor? Nick Bostrom? Uh, yes, yes, he's been talking to Nick Bostrom. And that got quite a bit of attention. He's been talking to Nick Bostrom about the dangers of AI. So, uh, and of course, you know, he's got all these very sort of transhumanist ideas. What does he actually want to do with AI? Does he want to accelerate AI or does he want to have a more nuanced uh, review of the issues and opportunities with it? So, uh, go ahead, go ahead uh, Keith. Uh, I'd say both. He's very yes. interested in the development and like progression of AI research, but he also wants to make sure that it's not abused uh, especially in regards to capitalism. Um, yeah. <laughs> what kind of abuse? Such as companies just using it to lay off all their employees and then there are no more humans, I guess. <laughs> well, one of his campaign slogans is uh, humanity first. So he mm -hmm. wants robots to serve, uh, uh, to serve humans, uh, you know, not vice versa. And um, I, I, I like to, I, it seems to me that he's interested in, in using AI to, uh, yes, he, he's very supportive of AI, but he wants to regulate it. I like to believe that he's, he's trying to move humanity towards uh, elimination of, of, of work that is, that is boring, uh, anything that's boring that, that humans would rather not do, he would like to get 
uh, AI and, and uh, robots to do so that we can have uh, more leisure time and more time for creative work. I believe he said a few things about mental health and about a, a holistic approach to healthcare. Yeah. So AI is also included in that, but I'll talk about that in a bit. Um, so with mental health, our current healthcare system doesn't really pay as much attention to that as it maybe should. Um, our suicide rates are through the roof, depression, anxiety, um, longevity even is, has been declining for the past four or five years. Um, I think from, do you know the numbers, Hank? <laughs> I know that 50,000 people a year die of, of uh, opiate overdoses. That's <laughs> that we have an opiate epidemic. So, and that's one thing that Andrew Yang talks about uh, in a couple of places that he wants to decriminalize uh, opiate use. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and he's very concerned with coming up with solutions to the opiate epidemic. Yeah, so addiction as well. Um, but for healthcare, um, he wants to add mental health to our primary care sort of rotation. Um, and regarding AI, he wants to use AI to assist doctors and like nurse practitioners and the like to help diagnose and treat um, patients. Uh, promote, he wants to promote telemedicine uh, in underserved areas especially. And just fun technology innovation in that area in general. Um, so he's actually emphasizing positive uses of AI. At exactly. The same time as I have a question here on the YouTube live chat from uh, Gennady Stoyorov, who just asked, do you think that emphasizing the dangers of AI as opposed to the opportunities could prompt a technophobic backlash in the broader population? I think there already kind of is a technophobic backlash. Like it exists for sure. People are scared they're going to lose their jobs. Uh, I'm sure you've seen the McDonald uh, kiosks where they sell their food through those little pads. Yeah. Um, stuff like that. People have been scared of stuff like that. And it, I think that's just technology in general. Anything new is going to prompt a fear response. Um, but Andrew Yang bringing attention to it, I think is, he wants to, to, oh, words. <laughs> um, so yeah. Andrew Yang, oh, go, go on. <laughs> oh, no, I just wanted to say anybody, Anybody who really looks at Andrew Yang's policies will see that he's definitely not technophobic. Yeah. He's pro self-driving cars. He's pro nuclear energy. Uh, he's got geoengineering ideas on combating climate change. So that, that anybody who thinks that Andrew Yang is technophobic is, 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 has only looked at him very superficially. If you look at his platform, you, you can see that he's the least technophobic uh, of, of any of the candidates. But how about Americans? Like, I suppose uh, many Americans are technophobic. Many Americans like technology? Is that what you said? No, no. Many Americans might be uh, technophobic. Oh, technophobic. Uh, so, uh, I, so yeah. I, I, I don't know. Uh, Keith and I live in Silicon Valley. That, <laughs> yes. That's what I was saying. But that's why we would hope that someone like Andrew Yang would be able to He's not technophobic, he's cautious. He wants to make it safe, I guess would be the word, to have our technology serve us in the future. And a lot of his policy ideas reflect that. And I think, oh yeah, go on. Do you think Americans will uh, be able to believe more in the potential of technology as opposed to succumb to their fears of it? And if, and if so, um, who? Because I suppose uh, on the West Coast or East Coast, although often here this in the US, which is on the you have the West Coast and the East Coast, which are like 
civilized, and then in the middle, you have... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> so that's a bit of a generalization. We were, we were going to stay positive. David said to stay positive, yes. But, but how, how I know a lot of Midwesterners, how yes. How do you think you can manage to convince uh, some people who are afraid of technology, of the potential of it? So my view is it's got to be a vision that everybody can identify with. The people worry that there is a vision of technological progress, but some of they're going to be left behind. That it's only going to be the fortunate few, the 1%, the elite, the people of nowhere, as it's sometimes called, as opposed to the people of somewhere, that the, 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 these will benefit and everybody else will be left behind. And there are some statistics backing that up, as was mentioned earlier, the statistics on uh, life uh, life expectancy are taking a, a turn downwards uh, in many ways, uh, especially for people in the quartz middle of the country, as opposed to people at the, at, at the more wealthy parts on, in, in various states. So I, what I liked about Andrew Young myself is he did seem to have a, an answer that people will get this uh, freedom dividend regardless of their circumstances. But my question is, is that going to be enough? I mean, the usual objection to UBI is that if we can afford it, then it's going to be too small and isn't going to actually change people's lives. And if we make it larger so that it will make a difference in people's lives, then the society as a whole can't afford it. There just isn't enough money to go around. Uh, so um, how is, how is uh, Andrew Yang proposing to pay for this UBI and therefore bring more people in a credible way into this positive in the future? You want to do that, Keith? You can talk yeah, about the VAT yeah. tax. And the Europeans probably know about the VAT tax because I think it's been in, there's been a VAT tax in many European countries for a long time. Yeah, so a VAT tax is a value-added tax. And... For Andrew Yang, he's planning to tax anyone who's benefiting from automation, so companies that are benefiting from automation and therefore laying off their workers, et cetera. And that is how he's planning to pay for the UBI. So when the companies lay off workers due to automation, they become uh, vulnerable to an additional tax? Or is this just yeah. a normal corporation tax whereby companies that make profits should they uh, pay a share of that to the public purpose um i don't I know that answer yeah. <laughs> i think it has to do with any production and the switch to a VAT tax is interesting because it means less emphasis on income tax, less emphasis on the wealth tax, and more tax on when people spend, then a larger portion of that will be repurposed. And the usual objection to that is, well, it's going to affect the poorer people disproportionately. It's not a progressive tax. So, but this is uh, how Andrew there, is proposing it should be paid for? There, There is a... Uh a discussion that the inflation rate will go up and the inflation rate might go up seven or eight percent is the number that I've heard. And that will impact the, um, uh, you know, the working class, uh, the inflation rate, but it's not going to offset the tremendous amount of, of welfare they're going to get out of $12,000 a year. So it'll, it will have some impact, but it, they would, they would still prefer to get the $12,000 a year. They would like to secure the bag is the actual slogan. Well, at this point, I should ask, is there any chance that Andrew is going to win the nomination? I mean, is there any evidence yet on polling figures? Is he way off the bottom or is he at the top or somewhere in the middle? Well, I like to follow what the Las Vegas uh, betting odds are. And right now they have him in sixth, uh, they have him in sixth place. I'm going to try to sixth get that place. on. That's very impressive. Yeah. Yes, I'm going to try to get that up. This is the top five. Is that online? Do you have that? Yes. Yeah, so that's the top five, right? Uh, Bernie Sanders, see. Kamala Harris, that, Beto uh, O'Rourke, Joe Biden. Yes, but I'm going to get the another get another one here uh, that'll show you that he is he's the next one up. He's the sixth, and he's going up. And you can see that he's ahead of very famous uh, senators and politicians, like he's ahead of Elizabeth Warren. Cory Booker and uh, Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard uh, in terms of Las Vegas betting. Uh, in terms of actual polling right now, I think he, 
uh, he's getting about 3%. But his, he's trending up and other people are trending down. So at least in Las Vegas, which is where the money is, um, he's in sixth place. But uh, Biden hasn't even declared, and he might not run. So maybe Andrew Yang is in fifth place. So and does that mean that Andrew will have a chance to take part in televised debates? He's yes, already in. Yeah. Yes, he's going to be. Uh, if you could, if you could get these off the screen for me, David, that would be great. <laughs> You've got to find the bit that says "stop sharing" at the top of your screen. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, he, yeah, when is that? I, I was going to go. I think it's in Miami in June, like June 27th or 24th in Miami. He's in a presidential debate, um, the Democratic candidate debate. Right. And tell me more about some of his other technological ideas, like his ideas on uh, climate change and geoengineering. Oh, yeah, that's, I get to talk about that. That's pretty darn fun. That's uh, that's any transhumanist dream. Um, he's been getting a lot. I wanted to to mention uh, just in terms of technophobia, Andrew Yang has actually been getting a lot of criticism because people think he's not significantly cautious about uh, technology. Like there's a lot of people who who are nervous about self driving cars, and Andrew Yang is supportive about uh, self driving cars. Andrew Yang is also supportive of nuclear energy. And of course, there's a, a huge percentage of environmentalists that are nervous about uh, nuclear energy. Uh, and in terms of, of climate change, Andrew Yang has, you know, very transhumanist ideas. Uh, here's three of them placing mirrors in space to reflect the sun's radiation away from the earth and uh, building walls on the sea floor to stop Antarctica glaciers from melting. And I think the wildest, uh, here's another one, inventing machines to suck carbon out of the air. And I think the wildest one is setting off volcanic eruptions to spread sun-reflecting aerosols. So <clears throat> he's gotten some criticism from this uh, <laughs> for being uh, perhaps not sufficiently cautious. But uh, his point of view is that um, we are already geoengineering right now in a really negative way. We're hacking the earth in a bad way. And he believes that we should uh, try um, using technology to, uh, to uh, control climate change. He also wants to do like very basic things, low-tech solutions like planting trees and, uh, and, other, kinds of, and other kinds of carbon capture. I mean, one uh, complaint people have about volcanoes, for example, it's true that when there's been a big volcanic eruption, I think Mount Pinatubo is the most recent one from about 20 or 30 years ago, the Earth's temperature did cool by one or two degrees, but it doesn't cool yes. in a uniform way. There are some parts of the Earth that suffered uh, greatly. So people have looked at some of these solutions, they uh, sometimes say, oh, Techno-optimists, they don't realize the complications. You might indeed balance out the average temperature, but some parts of the Earth will be covered in drought. Other parts of the Earth will have lots of pollution as a result. Uh, and they will say, let's uh, focus on the more straightforward solutions, such as planting trees or sucking the CO2 out of the air, which is a uh, more mainstream geoengineering, if I can call it that. Yes. But I think these ideas should be discussed. And, uh, exactly. That's really all Andrew Yang is saying, that these ideas should be discussed. And he's been a, uh, he's been a, a pioneer in, in saying that a lot of new ideas should be discussed. Uh, it seems like every week he starts discussing something that has never been discussed. Uh, an example of that is the value of circumcision. Should, uh, is circumcision really something that you know, all little boys should go through? Um, so he's, he's not saying that we definitely have to set off volcanoes. He's just saying... Let's discuss uh, using technology to perhaps do some of these things. And there are some sacred criticized. cows yeah. which uh, have, uh, have been avoided in discussions up to now, which uh, we need to have a more open mind about, like nuclear exactly. energy. Exactly. He has a very open mind, and he has all, he's, a, he's just an idea factor. He just keeps turning out really in, innovative and interesting, in, very interesting ideas. Well, here's another question that uh, actually all three of you might want to have a go at answering. It's another question from Gennady, who asks, well, 
what is actually the cause of the rise in Andrew's popularity since the in the last few months? It doesn't seem to be due to his advocacy of transhumanism, for example, because he, he isn't. So, and what, what can we as transhumanists learn from this search? I mean, should we be talking more about uh, sacred cow issues, or is there something else that Andrew's doing which uh, other transhumanist groups around the world, maybe the US Transhumanist Party, maybe the party in the UK, should be doing in the same way? Uh, I, I can I can give you my point of view, and then you want to go, Keith? Um, uh, yeah, sure. Uh, An Andrew Yang has... Um, He's not well known. He started off, you know, virtually unknown. He got an award from Obama for his Ventures for America uh, project that he did, but not very well known. But um, his his media strategy was to simply accept any uh, any offer that he got. Uh, so he went on Joe Rogan, the Joe Rogan Experience, I think it's called, and he was interviewed by Joe Rogan, and he got a huge bump after that. He got an enormous amount of attention and donations. Uh, Joe Rogan is a very popular podcaster who's actually a libertarian, but he's, uh, Joe Rogan is very well respected. So he got a, a bump in that. He's been, he's been doing all kinds of, he was on uh, Trevor Noah. Was he on Trevor Noah? No, he wasn't on Trevor Noah. He was on, um, uh, maybe he was on Trevor Noah. He did a really comic bit on some, on some show. But how do you get invited on these shows? Because I'm sure Matthew and I would love to be invited onto the Joe Rogan <laughs> show, and maybe you, you two would as well. What's, what's the way to get that attention in the first place? Well, I think he's getting attention for UBI, and he's getting attention for coming up with uh, three or four innovative uh, first pioneering person to suggest these ideas. He's So he's starting to get more and more attention all the time because he's – People want to read about him now. He's he's a a, a very interesting uh, churner of new ideas. Um, he, I, now everybody knows that he's 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 the meme guy. He's the meme king right now. There's an enormous amount of memes. Uh, a lot of them they say come from the alt right um, website 4chan. Uh, but people are having a lot of fun uh, creating memes uh, about Andrew Yang. Are they positive or negative memes, uh, or are they just a? Uh, well, I, I haven't seen them, and I, I'm not a follower of 4chan. I don't know much about it, to be honest. Uh, they're really entertaining, uh, but uh, Andrew Yang has gotten a lot of criticism for that. I, I was talking to, I was having breakfast with somebody the other day, and he goes, "Well, I could never support Andrew Yang because it seems like the ultra right likes Andrew Yang," and it's true. Uh, there is a. a a demographic that is just like, yeah, we want to secure the bag and we're going to spend a thousand dollars a month, uh, you know, living in a basement, uh, playing games, playing video games. So that's, there is an alt-right community that is perhaps likes Andrew Gang for that. Go ahead. It's alt-right goodness. It's just uh, mindless. It's just, for, it's just, yeah, yeah. It's just a bunch of kids who just like to have fun, basically. But I would not say it's I'll try to be honest. Uh, I don't know. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, I would agree with that. But uh, Keith, why don't you go ahead and w t tell us why you think Andrew Yang has increased in popularity? Well, he has the backing of the internet, and the internet is powerful right now. Everyone around the world kind of has. Well, not everyone, but a good amount of people around the world have access to the internet and like with the amount of memes that not just 4chan but twitter reddit and like all those big social media sites have on him he's getting a lot of attention just kind of organically through social media um i think a lot of that is based because of his policy platforms that how they're very new and um, yeah. <laughs> I think it's not just that he has a uh, memorable ideas. Uh -huh. I think it's that there's some su substantive thinking behind the ideas in my experience. Because the first time I heard of him, I thought, oh, here's a guy who wants UBI. Well, he's just jumping on that bandwagon. I didn't give it very careful thought. But when I started reading his book, I was really impressed. It's quite a deep book. It's a uh, well-researched and he's obviously got a lot of his own personal experience. He's, he's got a background as an entrepreneur. He has tried to create jobs uh, in the uh, deprived city areas. 
and he observes quite carefully. So I imagine that when people start looking into his uh, ideas, they're finding something of substance, which and then uh, encourages them to get uh, more involved. So uh, the lesson for transhumanists, and we, we've got an incredibly interesting story on the whole. Uh, we just need to find the right hooks that will draw people in, that when they come further in, they see things that they make them think, wow, actually, this is well thought through. Yeah, um, I was actually a big Bernie Sanders supporter. Uh, four years ago and uh, one of the reasons I like Bernie Sanders was because he had new ideas he had ideas they were new and and since then uh, a lot of Bernie Sanders ideas have been um, adopted by you know mainstream Democrats and I, I sort of think Andrew Yang is is this this year's um, Bernie Sanders in terms of being the guy with the new ideas and I think that a lot of the other candidates and a lot of other politicians in the United States are going to start uh, having to pay attention to Andrew Yang's ideas and, and start adopting them, um, especially UBI. Uh, I think there's been at least three other candidates that have talked about UBI as well. They feel like they need to jump on that a little bit as well. I think that would be uh, Bernie Sanders, maybe Kamala Harris, and uh, Mayor Pete. I can't pronounce his last name. I think they've all uh, sort of addressed UBI as well. And this is great. Andrew Yang has said from the beginning that... Uh, his goal might not necessarily be to be president, but it is to introduce these ideas to the American public and to get um, to get the leadership in America talking about these ideas and to get the public uh, aware of these ideas and and enthusiastic about using them. I think that's uh, right. I mean, we in the transhumanist party in the UK currently our goal is really to change the political landscape not necessarily by ourselves becoming elected and kicking out all the other parties, which is uh, not credible at this time, but if we can place some ideas into the broader circulation, and then we don't mind if other parties uh, then adopt them and talk about the same things as we're talking about, improve mental health, using technology to improve uh, democracy and identify fake news uh, more readily. So I like the story that uh, Bernie Sanders had some... Uh, ideas which are beyond the fringe when he started talking about them. And it, but as people reflected on them more carefully, they thought, actually, they deserve a, a more mainstream uh, view, uh, understanding as well. So that's happened. And so maybe it'll happen the same with uh, some of Andrew's uh, proposals. Yeah, I wanted to mention, uh, Andrew Yang has a slogan that I very much like. It, it, it is not left, not right, forward. And I really like that because uh, U.S. politics is extremely polarized now. Right? You know, people just the left hates the right, vice versa, et cetera, et cetera. And he's he's trying to trying to avoid that and just with his slogan, which I think is wonderful. And he does have a lot of support from libertarians. I think something some something like forty four percent of libertarians like UBI, and there's even a lot of uh, Republican support. Some some Republican support. Well, that reminds me of, of FM 2030, the pioneering philosopher of transhumanism, whose uh, famous saying was, he, he's not left or right, but he's up, not quite yeah. far. Uh, that we should be looking to the stars literally, but also metaphorically. Yes, that's that's wonderful. I think Andrew Yang would say that this whole left-right thing is, is just uh, an outmoded way of looking at politics. Yeah. I have mixed views on this because, in a way, uh, of course it's true. We want uh, discussion to focus on new things. We want focus on the possibilities of human enhancement. We want to focus on this uh, different dimension rather than the traditional dimensions. And we want to look at technological solutions for climate change and technological solutions for gun safety and so on. So we do want to introduce this other dimension. So that part I like. But I don't think we can quite get away from some of the traditional discussions either. And the two discussions that still remain, I think, are to what extent should the public state be regulating the market or to what extent the market should be left to be as free as possible so that it can determine its own market solutions. That seems to be a deep running uh, discussion. And the second, second is something we've already touched on, which is what's the right way to do taxation? What's the right way to have a redistribution? Is redistribution good or bad? Can we have redistribution based on income tax or wealth tax? Or a, and, the, and these topics don't go away simply by saying, oh, well, we're not left or right, we're forward. I think the, there is a need for some hard thinking there, regardless. Mm. Yeah, I know that the libertarians who like UBI uh, and like Andrew Yang's uh, uh, ideas on it, um, 
they like the idea of getting rid of that whole sort of uh, uh, nanny state um, bureaucracy where there's all these, like, you know, there's all these different kinds of programs. They like getting rid of all of that. That's their, that, that would be like why they would like it. They like the idea of everybody just getting a check for a thousand dollars and eliminating all these people that, uh, you know, work as clerks, handing out, small amounts of money to this person and that person. There's also something very empowering about UBI. And rather than having to fill out forms and hope you get your little welfare check or something, not having to do any of that and just getting your $1,000. And uh, I think Yang regards that as, as, as very empowering and a lot of other people do as well. Dare we talk about gun control? Is that uh, going to cause this uh, discussion to become more con controversial and fractious? Uh, I no, think I, think that's, I think that's Keith's topic. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, that's yeah I mean, a lot of it is just background checks. Uh, he wants to have a tiered licensing system for different gun types, like hunting rifles and handguns versus semi-automatics versus automatics and advanced weaponry. Um, and he wants to invest in, like, gun technology where you could have maybe fingerprint sensors or some other biometric that would allow the gun to be only used by the owner, whoever has that license, right? And that would hopefully reduce gun violence. Like he also wants to, I'm sorry. He also wants to encourage gun manufacturers to make guns without interchangeable parts. So kind of like Apple products where you can't really modulate it at all. Um, that would so that you don't people, get bumps. Yeah, yeah, that would stop people buying a gun legally and then converting mm -hmm. it to something which is more powerful than would be have been legal in the first place. Exactly. But can't people just get around that? Can't they 3D print guns? I think he did talk about 3D printing guns at one point, and I, he does want to either license or restrict that somehow as well. Again, I like the injection of new ideas in here. I'm not saying that the ideas will be central, but we, mm -hmm. we don't know in advance, and it's worth looking at them and uh, casting aside our traditional instincts. So some people are instinctually in favor of having uh, free access to guns, and other people are instinctively in favor of uh, restricting access to guns. And we need to set some of these instincts to one side and look at new ideas uh, to see what, 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 what new things might be possible. Yeah, I just wanted to comment on that just a little bit. I come from a family of, of actual, uh, uh, I'm from a large family. I have seven, uh, six brothers and sisters, and most of them are Trump voters. And um, the, two, uh, the two positions that they won't budge on are, are guns. They don't want their guns taken away. And the other is abortion. They're anti-abortion. So these are two, two deal breaker uh, positions in the United States that are really difficult to really difficult to get people to budge on. Can, can you tell us uh, why? Because from from our side of the Atlantic, it's a bit difficult to comprehend. <laughs> you know, so oh gee, why do I love their guns so much. I I <clears throat> if you go if you go on Reddit and you read about uh, Andrew Yang, there are a lot of people who say I like Andrew Yang except um, he doesn't support the Second Amendment, so I, I would never vote for him. So the, the Second Amendment is, is, is freedom to have guns. But and, he's, uh, he's saying you can and, have a gun, it's just that uh, it's personally identifiable, I suppose, right? So that, that's kind of a compromise, no? There have been some countries, I think, was it, it, was it New Zealand or Australia? Like people were turning in their guns or the government was asking people to turn in their guns and things like this. Or was it in Brazil so that they could uh, exchange for an Xbox or something like that? Yeah, I don't know. There, there is some kind I of... I think a field. couple of countries have done that. So there is a yeah. buyback program. I don't think Andrew Yang actually has any policy within his gun policy to actually like take people's guns away. It's more yeah. about just making, making it so that you have like a system in place that you can track the guns where you make sure they're safe and not being used by people who don't actually own them. Mm -hmm. And he does have a buyback program, but that's voluntary if you have too many guns, I guess, and you want to sell them back to the government. Um, yeah. 
So my thoughts on this is twofold. First, uh, I think people use stories to identify themselves. It's the core parts of their identity. And this story of uh, Americans needing to have the freedom to band together and form well-regulated militia, I think that's the language of the Second Amendment. I'm sorry, I don't have it at hand. It's part of a powerful story about the, the history of America and uh, their identity. And stories are powerful, but stories can also be misleading. And I think we're all victims to some, at some stages to stories about our, our lives and our cultures, which uh, might have been useful in the past, but which are no longer the right things for us. So I don't think the answers to these are to come in with reasoning. The answer is to, in a sense, give a, a bigger and a better story, a story in which people can say, well, actually, this is what I wanted to do, and I see you've got a, a, a vision in which I'll be part as well, and that will allow them to evolve from the current understanding. Not that they're going to reverse it and think of themselves as going backwards, but they can instead, in some sense, see themselves as moving forwards. But that's hard, and there may be a more practical thing in the short term, which uh, Gennady has suggested again in the live chat, which is that there are some topics which we should simply avoid uh, coming down on one side or the other, that these things don't need to have answers in the short term. So the U.S. Transhumanist Party apparently is agreed not to make any stance on gun control or on abortion, simply because these are uh, yeah. troublesome I notions. Would I, I would agree with that. If you look at the last election, uh, Trump won the rural areas and he did not win the urban areas. And in the rural areas, people want to keep their guns uh, for whatever reason. I, I can go to any one of my brothers who lives out in the country and they have five to seven guns and they'll, they, want, they want to spend the afternoon maybe like going out and shooting something. Um, <laughs> that's rural America and they vote for Trump. And they're they're not, and it's better just to avoid this, like Genedy suggested. Well, there is another thought that's come up on the live chat. It's from V Hope, and says, "Well, maybe there's another technological solution to abortion." And people may say, "Yuck!" or "Wow!" I'm not going to look at this. But if we are being calm and rational, at least we should look at it for a moment. Which is that there's a technology called ectogenesis. I mean, it's not here today, but in the future there may be artificial wombs. Maybe that's a, a, a solution to the abortion issue, which more people would be able to endorse. Uh, I don't know if any politician at all has picked that up yet or if Andrew Rang, Yang's written about it, but uh, I think it's worth uh, at least putting that on the table as another discussion point. So thanks, V. And you know, yeah. that the U.S. Transhumanist Party actually favors ectogenesis, uh, which, by the way, is not a traditional left-right issue. So it's another example of looking beyond traditional uh, clashes and finding a, an interestingly new, different solution. Uh, ectogenesis would allow women to uh, stay in the workplace as well. They would not have to um, get pregnancy leave as well. It would, it would help their careers. Yes. And I've been advised by one uh, professor, uh, Steve Fuller from uh, Warwick, that uh, transhumanists should put more focus on ectogenesis rather than immortality. You know, we transhumanists talk a lot about extending lives, which appeals to a certain sort of people. But if we put more emphasis on ectogenesis, then suddenly there'd be a huge number of people saying, you know what, this makes sense for me. And so I'm not convinced about that either, but it's an interesting uh, angle. I agree with Steve on that. I think there's a lot of other things that um, uh, transhumanists should focus on other than extending life. Um, and, that's, and I think I agree with him. Or as uh, well as extending life. Yeah, as well as extending life. Yeah. Um, I wanted to mention just a couple things. There is UBI in uh, the United States already. Uh, and Andrew Yang talks about that. Uh, it's in Alaska. Uh, it's a very small amount. I think it's about $2,000 a year. But, um, and I think it's also in the city of Stockton, which is near the Bay Area in California. I think there's like a $500 a month uh, UBI for some people, and that that's, that's also been very successful. Do you know anything about that, Keith? That one right, in Stockton? Do you know yeah. how they distributed that? Like you said, to some people. I, I don't know. I know that uh, Andrew Yang has talked to the mayor of Stockton uh, about it, and, and they congratulate each other and they support each other. Um, 
And I know that the mayor of Stockton is African American and that Andrew Yang is, <clears throat> is, is, is trying to appeal to African Americans with, with the UBI um, and, and, and its success in Stockton. But other than that, I don't, I don't really know anything else about Stockton is, is sort of a basket case in Northern California. It had a, a complete collapse. Um, so I don't know about the Stockton case, and I'll be interested to find out more, but the Alaska mm -hmm. case is interesting. It, as you say, it's uh, relatively small. I'd had one to two thousand dollars a year. I think it varies depending on the the finances of the oil companies in any particular time. It's financed from the common resources of all people in Alaska, the oil that's being dug up from there. But what's also interesting is that this uh, has a uh, bipartisan support. Uh, all the different people who have been in government in Alaska, including uh, the Republican Sarah Sarah Palin, former candidate to be vice president, uh, she has uh, been supporting that idea as well. Uh, that it's not enough to live on, but it is enough to make a significant difference in people's lives every year, and so it's a model that can be extended further. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Gennady says the Stockton case so far is only a limited trial. It's 130 people getting $500 for 18 months. I think that's the issue, that a lot of the trials have been relatively small. I mean, people uh, such as Guy Standing, a professor in London based also in uh, Switzerland, has written extensively about trials in various places in India as well as uh, uh, throughout the world. And most of the trials have been relatively small in number. And it's quite clear that uh, the beneficiaries of these trials do have improved uh, quality of life by numerous metrics, including educational attainment, including uh, peace of mind, including willingness to take more risks, uh, setting up new businesses. But it's harder to extrapolate f from these initial trials uh, with some confidence into larger scale trials. And so I think that's why the Alaska case is particularly interesting because it's the whole state of Alaska, even though it's not yet enough to live on. So I think uh, we need to do some more trials around the world and also need to do some more modeling around the world. I think there was a trial in Finland that uh, Andrew Yang has referred to. And um, isn't there a, a trial of some kind going on in the city of Ghent in Brussels? Is there, is there a UBI there? I know that a number of trials were set up in Belgium and Holland, but they haven't gone ahead as quickly as people had hoped, in part, I think, because of changes in at least some of the national governments. The Finnish case, uh, I think Matt, you referred to it at the, at the beginning, it's uh, not yet finished, uh, and it hasn't... Uh, well, the, the positive news is, as was said, that people do seem to have a better peace of mind as a result of this. And with a better peace of mind, guess what? Many other things become possible. Generally, people who are not in that situation of being out of work or being depressed don't realize quite how bad it is. I think George Orwell may have written at one stage that having being a unsure where your next piece of money comes from, d d d bring down your IQ by 10 points or something. I'm sure he probably didn't say that, but they, there are there are writers who have commented along these lines. If you are just panicking all the whole time, how can you get income? It doesn't put your mind in a properly creative or expansive or collaborative state, and it makes your life much more miserable as a result. So this payments uh, are uh, providing at least a starting point for uh, more more flourishing. And I think politicians do need uh, very seriously to look at it for all kinds of reasons. It's not just the humanitarian point of view. It's the risk that society is changing and there's going to be less and less uh, opportunity for, quote, normal people to get uh, good wages from doing the jobs for which they thought they were being trained at university. I, I have a question. Um, do you think that you can compare UBI <clears throat> to like these countries like Norway and Botswana that have like nationalized uh, certain industries uh, to the benefit of the, of the population. Like Norway has, it's one of the, it's one of the wealthiest countries in the world uh, due to its oil. And uh, I think it's, um, it's one of the happiest countries on all those indexes as well, because they've used their oil money for, um, I guess, education and they invested it. It's, it's going to, um, it provides a lot of benefits to the population. And I know, I think Botswana is, 
it's one of the wealthiest countries in Africa, and they've they've nationalized, I think, some mining industries. It might be diamonds or gold or something. And so Botswana, in the middle of sub-Saharan Africa, is is really a has a middle class uh, is a middle class country. Um, do you think it's fair to compare those to UBI in a certain way, like just uh, creating benefits for the population at large with with the money that the country uh, generates? Well, I like the emphasis here on looking at what other countries are doing and uh, seeing what we can learn from them rather than being constrained by uh, a limited political history in a, in a single country. And so each country is different. Norway has had the benefits of the oil money uh, and has grown wealthy, but the way they've invested it has indeed has the benefits of making lots of people happy. There are other countries which have been rich in oil. Venezuela and Saudi Arabia both come to mind, where there's nothing like the same general degree of uh, public happiness in, in the countries. So I really think it's important that we look at what other countries are doing with a view not just on measuring their GDP, but as looking at this whole general statistics of happiness and health. Botswana, which I think is in, in Southern Africa, is a fascinating case in its own right too. It's a country that's had much more of a democratic heritage despite everything else that's going on. There was a film made uh, recently about the historical uh, part, uh, historical episode about uh, 50 years ago in, in Botswana, when the, the, the prince of Botswana married a, a middle-class woman from Britain. Uh, and it's a nice drama. I can't quite remember the name off the top of my head, but it gives an interesting insight, you know, of a different style of living. It's not a, as focused on, a, well, we are the elites and the elites deserve. It's much more a focus of, a, we are in this together. Let's have a, the, a collaborative approach. Yeah. So we're almost out of time. We've uh, been running for almost an hour. Uh, maybe I'm going to go around the panel. If there are final remarks that you would like to uh, talk about, uh, then uh, let, let, let's hear them. Uh, do you want to go first, people, Keith? What should people okay. take away and have in mind if they forget everything else we've been discussing in the last hour? Hmm. They should take in mind, for one thing, that Andrew Yang ex exists. Yes. <laughs> he is... <laughs> A candidate that should be on everyone's radars, especially transhumanist radars. Uh, a lot of his policies will be desirable or interesting to transhumanists. Um, yeah. <laughs> right, well, thanks very much for coming and, and sharing your, your insights on uh, Andrew's policies. We're we'll watching, watching oh. and, you, and for those who don't know, there is this Facebook group where you keep people in, informed about, about it. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to thank certain transhumanists. I wanted to mention that not all transhumanists uh, support Andrew Yang, and not everybody has joined our Facebook page. And some people don't. Some transhumanists aren't, aren't even in favor of UBI. But I wanted to thank certain people that have uh, tremendously helped our Facebook page and have brought people in. Uh, Rachel Haywire is a member of Transhumanists for Andrew Yang. And uh, she's been promoting Andrew Yang, and I think she brought in about 50 people on our Facebook page. Uh, Anya Petrova, uh, she is actually a, a local transhumanist, and she is the leader of the East Bay, uh, East Bay Yang Gang. Uh, Roman Yampalski is an AI scientist. I think he's at the University of Louisville in Kentucky. And he, uh, he's a member, and he has brought in quite a few people. Uh, Genity, who's been a... Uh, part of this chat. Uh, Kevin Russell is a member. Nicole Salek Anderson is a writer on UBI. Uh, Lincoln Cannon is a founder of uh, Mormon Transhumanist Association, and he's, a, he's one of our uh, uh, Facebook page members. And then there's uh, Anatoly Carlin of, of Russia, who wrote a wonderful essay supporting Andrew Yang. And there's Ire Oskaral of Turkey, who is also a, a member. And so I wanted to thank them and all the other you know, 466 members for, uh, for, for being part of this. Matthew, would you vote for Andrew Yang if you were an American? Yes, I would, definitely. I'm very happy that uh, finally there is such a thirst for something new and uh, something new in what I think is the betterment of society. 
because uh, I don't think uh, Trump uh, was the good kind of new. <laughs> <laughs> But I think people are fed up with the uh, current, uh, you know, political um, speech, and and it's great to to step out of the left and right and so on. And I'm really excited to see where this is going. I wish uh, he would. Uh, campaign under the transhumanist, uh, you know, banner, I suppose. But, uh, you know, it's very, it's very close to what actually we advocate here in the UK, which is fantastic. So, you know, um, it, it's, it's good for us to see that there is echo, you know, in, the, in this type of, uh, of thing. And the Internet is, al is along with it. So hopefully we're on, a, we're on a good trajectory here. And, uh, yeah, that's it. So a few final remarks for me. Uh, for those who are watching who don't think that the uh, transhumanists should be supporting Andrew Yang, uh, by all means, get in touch, and uh, we're going to have an open discussion on all kinds of things. So please, please, please do that. Uh, let me know who else you think would be good guests on this as we look around the world, uh, not just Britain, but elsewhere for things we can learn from, things that can help us to change the political landscape in a constructive way more quickly, and more effectively, and more lastingly. Uh, I did get some answers popping up on the chat window to some of the other topics that we didn't have time to dig into when I did ask, what's the secret of getting onto the Joe Rogan show? And uh, John uh, Michel Carter offers his uh, advice, which is you need somebody else who was a previous guest on the show to recommend you. Mm. So he thinks it was Sam Harris, the philosopher and writer mm. who was interviewed by Joe Rogan, who mentioned to him, you know, you should get this uh, guy Andrew Yang on board. So yeah. it's also about nurturing uh, good relationships. It's finding uh, people who can speak up for us. It's about what? Influencing the influencers, and educating the educators. Uh, I think one part where the story is still maybe not quite as clear as it should be is on the payment for UBI. Now, maybe, I've, uh, maybe I'm being a bit too critical, but I've heard it said so many times that it's not completely clear how this will be paid for. And there's been a number of ideas floating around in this discussion. I'd like to see it sh uh, uh, firmed up somewhere. Uh, Janadi reminds us that there is the suggestion of a land value tax as well, which another transhumanist politician, Zoltan Istvan, has advocated. And uh, that's something that's been on my to-do list for a long time to figure out whether or not I like the idea of a land value tax. So that's another possibility. So there's some homework for us to do there. Tax Tobin as well, I suppose. Uh, what, sorry? Uh, so the, the tax Tobin, which is the, the Tobin tax. tax yes. Yeah. Tax on financial transactions. Well, I, I'm a big fan of that too. I think a lot of what happens in the financial world is finance for finance's sake. Financiers are becoming wealthy by inventing products for the sake of other financiers. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not against for the financial world at all. I think uh, uh, finance can be beneficial finance. It's like AI, in fact. You can have AI for AI's sake. You can have AI for geek's sake. Likewise, you can have finance for the beneficial sake and you can have finance for the financier's sake. So putting on a Tobin tax would, uh, I think, uh, uh, first of all, generate more money for the public good. And secondly, it would discourage people from some of these uh, uh, less helpful uh, methods of doing finance. So that's another thing we might discuss in a future event. So thanks to everybody for uh, speaking uh, live to us on the chat. Uh, I'm sure more will watch the show in its re recorded version. And uh, let us know who else you'd like to have on the, uh, the show and what other topics we should uh, talk about so we can get more quickly to this world of sustainable superabundance for everybody uh, with uh, transhumanism going not left, not right, but certainly forwards and probably upwards as well. Thanks all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Okay. Cheers. All the best. Yes.